Доброго дня, друзі. Всім дякую, по-перше, за увагу до нашої панельної дискусії. І всіх вітаю на нашій панельній дискусії, а також вітаю окрему команду. Greetings at our panel discussion. And for having this possibility despite the coronavirus and all the restrictions connected with it to be present at the forum that is one of the key events for media community of Ukraine. My name is uh, uh, Marina Beskorvaeva and I represent the British Embassy in Kiev and I'm countering disinformation media development program manager. So I shall start our today's panel with a thesis uh, of, of quite obvious that we are spending more and more time online. This forum is online, this panel is online, and everything that is connected with it, the online and cyber digital uh, space more and more becomes part of our life shaping our habits we collect you know cats in mobile apps uh, competing with our friends and changing our habits the way we spend our time we also uh, are using different mobile apps like uh, uh, you know meals and trying to compete with our friends i find it interesting to follow my hab my eating habits in one of the mobile apps so it's a game space that uh, ha is becoming a part of our life is shaping our habits and is changing our behavior at the same time online brings new challenges we we are becoming more vulnerable to information influences which are not always useful and good. We are become vulnerable to disinformation and it gets harder to check information that we consume. And at the same time, more often we hear that the initiatives aimed at um, countering disinformation are like in the ideological vicious circle. We cannot always understand if our traditional approaches of fact-checking, of debunking are efficient enough and uh, if uh, uh, they are of in, in interest of our audience. And then there's a question, what are more alternative approaches, which uh, more creative means of counteracting disinformation? And I offer to talk about this uh, today during our panel we have selected the name, the title, Game as a Tool Against Fake News. And our speakers today will be Jon Rosenberg, uh, researcher at the University of Cambridge, Department of Psychology. Also, Lyubov Kvasuk, uh, of, uh, the worker on IREX projects. Also, Nicholas Melendez, uh, behavioral scientist from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office's open source unit who also studies behavior. And I would like to speak about our guests about this and I would like to give floor to Jon first because several years ago he suggested a very interesting approach via games to teach consumers to differ fake information from good information and the game that Jon has developed offered to to try on the per personage of a bad boy and to go the entire way of since the media is created and how you can actually uh, bring disorder in the society by his by your actions i think that yon can describe his game and his idea much better and it will be interesting to hear what motivated him i will not take floor of our speaker he can speak about the idea better and then we can share the link to the game so that you could 
play it if you want. It's available both in Ukrainian and Russian languages, and I think it was translated into 14 different languages, and it was rather popular in the world. As I mentioned, you get the chance to try on a bad character or some like villain, and then you choose the media, its form, its title or name, and you have like the devil on your shoulder whispering different advice to you, which are usually not very nice, how you can more and more have bad influence or bring bad influence to the society, either, uh, you know, spread some fake about a politician or some emotionally colorful, colored thing or to purchase the network of bots and how much money that can cost so several strategies are offered to you and you can uh, according to your own taste uh, to do the develop the design of a negative history so it's very interesting and worth trying i was always curious and maybe yon is going to mention it and uh, what if uh, such approach is not useful and not good? And what if it is going to make us a big favor and can teach us bad stuff and show how you can actually do it, especially if uh, it's, there are some younger, uh, you know, category of people like uh, teenagers. Maybe it will be especially interesting for them to try such things in real life. So, Pion, could you please comment if uh, you took that into account when you were developing this idea? Hello, my name is John Rosenbeek. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a researcher from the Cambridge University. And I research the changes in the east of Ukraine, as well as fake news and misinformation online. My main work uh, consists in improving people's skills to recognize fake information on a psychological level, which can be developed, use, uh, how can it be developed and how these skills can be scaled up in order so more people can use them. Next slide, please. Today I would like to talk with you about our work, about our online group, about fake news, which is called bad news. This game, Bad News, was launched in English in February 20, 2018. And we tried to introduce uh, an important uh, to use several techniques which are widespread in, in spreading uh, the fake information in the internet. Next slide, please. An example of this is uh, conspiracy theories. The elements of which the conspiracy theories consist of, how to recognize them, and why they are efficient. In our game, we have six su such techniques, six scenarios. Every scenario teaches you how uh, these techniques work. Everything happens uh, on behalf of a so-called bad guy, of, uh, of a person who creates fake news. In this game, you start as an anonymous user of a social network, but gradually you grow into your magnet uh, uh, keen of fake news, and you learn how fake news work from inside. If you do everything in a proper way, you get a lot of followers, uh, you uh, increase trust in you, and you cause chaos in the society. Next slide, please. 
On this uh, slide, you shall see a screenshot of how our bad news game looks like. We included several components of research into this game. For example, questionnaire, which helps uh, us see whether people will learn to detect fake information. We try to uh, to verify the efficiency of this work as a vaccine, vaccination against misinformation. And we do it in many ways. What we do, we analyze headlines. Next slide, please. We analyze uh, headlines, post, headlines post in Twitter or in other social networks which contain fake news or not. And we ask people before the game and after the game uh, how trustful this post is. And then we evaluate the difference between uh, the uh, uh, between the, the uh, opinion of the people before and after the game, and we hope that uh, they will learn how to tell fake news from real news. And we hope that these results will be will stay with the people for a long time. It looks like uh, it works quite well. Next slide, please. Our, the results of our research uh, are the following. People who play this game, they, show, they detect uh, fake information and misinformation better than the control group. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see that the efficiency of our game continues for more than two months. Next slide, please. We also try to understand whether this uh, game bad news is efficient in other languages, in languages other than English. It turned out that it is also relevant to German, Greek, Polish and Swedish versions of the game. Next slide, please. As of now, we have six scientific publications about this game, and I am very happy. I will be very happy to send you a link to these publications if you wish so. One of the results is that people older than 50 years are more susceptible to misinformation than the younger ones. I don't know whether it's uh, true for all the countries, but in every country that we, where we worked, so this is more or less so. One of the reasons behind that is, uh, in my own opinion, is that the young people who have used uh, internet since uh, their childhood, they know how to, easy it is to uh, create a website or to spread uh, news over the internet. While the uh, elderly, they have grown up in a society without internet. That is why to be a media for them, to be a producer of uh, it was quite difficult to create news to create content i mean in order to be a tv channel you had to have a lot of money for example or for example if you are a newspaper you need to pay journalists you need to pay salaries you need to pay for the office and so on and so forth there were much less news uh, websites before the uh, news uh, outlets before but now the situation is different in the past uh, the media had to maintain their reputation but after 30 years 
uh, in uh, the former Soviet countries where the media was state controlled, uh, the situation changed. Of course, there are differences between different cultures, but according to other parameters, uh, we don't see a huge difference between how uh, men and women, uh, uh, how men and women use our game. Next slide, please. Our game is available in 17 languages. Recently, we have launched a Russian and Ukrainian versions of this game. Next slide, please. So you can play this game using the following addresses. Next slide, please. And now we are also developing other tools. For example, we are working with WhatsApp in order to see whether we will manage to create a game which helps people detect misinformation in direct messaging apps, such as WhatsApp and Telegram. Next slide, please. I would like to say a couple of things more. What we also do, we try to prevent radicalization through gamification. This is just one of the projects that we now do in Lebanon. Next slide, please. We also work with people who have uh, suspicions uh, because of vaccination who don't vaccinate their people because of these fears. And next slide, please. And we, are, we now hope to try to use this approach to prevent spreading of uh, misinformation about coronavirus. And you know that there is a lot of information like that. Next slide, please. Well, I'm really sorry that uh, I don't have more time to spend with you. I will be more than happy to answer your questions via email. Thanks a lot. This was the presenta presentation on our first speaker. But we still have Nicolas Melendez with us, who represents, who is a behavioral scientist from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office's Open Source Unit, Great Britain. And I would like to uh, address my question to Nicolas. Perhaps you can tell us what do you think? such games, can it be that they will teach and will show bad methods, bad techniques, rather than they will teach people to tell the information? They can teach something bad instead of teaching. What is your opinion on that account? Um, so the game is based, uh, as I'm sure I don't mention, uh, someone to a, a small amount of something bad, they then will be able to recognize it and fight back against it. It's sort of similar to, um, you know, in medical terms, uh, why you, you receive a vaccination. So whilst, yes, you might be teaching uh, young people these skills, how to, how to manipulate um, an audience, it's far more likely that you are giving them the skills to be able to recognize when this is being done to them. It's unlikely that you will be, um, you know, training the next uh, the next troll farm employee. Mm -hmm. It's much more likely that you will actually just be helping them recognize uh, how they could be manipulated in their day to day life. Mm -hmm. But do you say that such probability does exist? The thing is that if someone was uh, wanting to mislead an audience, they would already be trying to do it. The game doesn't teach them 
uh, how to create, for example, a, a botnet uh, that could then manipulate audiences online at a large scale. It doesn't teach you specialized skills um, that uh, that are inaccessible elsewise. So I think, no, the, the chances that someone would use it in a significant way for bad are, are almost zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, may, it may, for example, give people the skills if they want to wind up their friends, um, you know, for example, showing emotion, conspiracy theory. We all have that friend who likes to start arguments mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of wind us up. And so perhaps those people will, will see it and use those skills. But I, I can't see it being um, a, any serious concern. Mm -hmm. Дякую за відповідь. Скажи, а ви у департаменті міністерства, що ви взагалі думаєте про But what do you think in your department about such non-traditional ways of fighting disinformation like games, gamification, alternative education, alternative trainings? How is it connected with your work? What are your opinions on this account? Sure. I, I think gamification um, is a, a possibly a really good uh, a really good tool to try and engage people uh, with this idea. So, um, media literacy, you know, it covers such a broad uh, range of subjects. But the problem is, is that it's really a universal issue. It's, it's something that, that we have a huge problems with it in the UK, in America. Uh, we're seeing it now more and more with uh, health information in, in places like Africa, in East Asia. Um, and so I think gamification provides an excellent solution to people actually training that will, will give them the skills. Uh, as a behavioral scientist, we use an approach that's named the COMB method. So when you want to change a behavior, a negative behavior, you look at the capability, the opportunity, and the motivation that someone may have to do or not do that behavior. And so uh, what can happen is that if you teach someone the skills, you know, say, for example, um, you, uh, you ask them to take part in an adult education training, um, and you force everyone to, to participate, you teach them how to verify information online, you teach them uh, how to, how to double-check sources, how to recognize if something is low quality or false, but they might not be motivated to actually do it. And so the thing is you need to change that motivation, and I think gamification is an excellent way to deliver. So into this problem. And so I think anything that takes more alternative methods is, is very important. And, and that's something also I wanted to say is, um, you know, we need to move away from the, the current traditional uh, fact-checking and debunking attitude. Um, you know, what, what we found is that a lot of the research suggests that fact-checking a, a false claim can actually uh, amplify it. It can also uh, not go to the right audiences, so the people who believe false information in the first place. And it can also serve to actually cement the false information in someone's mind. An example that I like to use is there's a, a false narrative, a conspiracy theory online that suggests that wearing a, a face mask um, reduces the level of oxygen in your blood and is therefore dangerous. So this is completely false, of course. And if you, as a, as a journalist, for example, you write levels, they don't cause any problems, etc, etc, et you might think, okay, great, my audience is going to read this, they're going to learn the truth. But the problem is, is that some audience members may take that, they may read it, they may say, oh, how interesting. And then what happens is maybe a month goes by, two months go by, and one of their friends mentions that they don't want to wear a mask because they're worried about it damaging their oxygen levels and reducing their oxygen levels. And that person who read the original article will think back I read something that said that. I read something that, that mentioned oxygen and face masks. But the problem is they might not remember the connection and where that connection was and what the association in reality was. All they remember is that they saw it from an authoritative source and they were, they were connected. And so in order to, to try and be a bit more creative, we need, uh, we need journalists, we need media executives. shows uh, that, that talks about how um, masks don't affect oxygen. 
you should show, um, you know, a famous athlete training. You should show uh, 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 Golovkin training, wearing a face mask, showing that it's not stopping his oxygen levels. And people, therefore, will they'll see that, they'll see him training, and it's a subtle way to push back against that piece of false information. We have 20 more minutes left, and there is one more speaker, Lubov Kvasyuk, and I think we will uh, uh, talk to Lubov Kvasyuk, and then if still, if there is still more time, then maybe we'll also ask questions to Lubov and Nicholas. So Lubov is a representative for IRIS in Ukraine, and IRIS is the organization that is implementing one of the large-scale uh, projects on media literacy in Ukraine, and they work with the schools and the universities. Apart from that, in their portfolio, their half-game uh, thing, like online course, oh, very, very fine. I can't translate it into Ukrainian. Lubov, can you help me to translate very, very fight? And what are your insights uh, on this course? Thank you for the possibility to uh, introduce our products, very, very fight. This is about the information literacy. Uh, while during our implementation of very important projects for Ukraine, and among the media literacy, we are creating different products which in different ways provide the possibility to people to master skills of critical perception of the information and that way increase their capacity to fighting disinformation, detect fakes in time manipulations. There are several products. This is uh, a game which ha which can be played online and offline. Uh, there are games uh, which we created ourselves. Uh, there are those games which are used by the participants, by our students, by our partners. They are now uh, on the stage of development. But I would like to pay your attention to you to pay attention to this online course. Uh, this is uh, it is called very verified. Uh, this online course is special and unique. It is quite unusual. Its concept is new. I have a couple of slides for you, visualization of this course. So can you please share my presentation on the screen? Uh, thank you. So you can see on this slide, on the next slide, actually, you shall see a cup of coffee. The concept is that this online course is, is associated with the time that you spent to have a cup of coffee. For most people, this is a daily habit. And uh, critical thinking shall also become a part of our everyday life, of our daily habit. In our course, the information is placed in such a way that if a person wants to, to learn something new, they can get access to all the parts of this course anytime they want. They might choose the time they want to spend learning things. All materials on this, on, uh, this online course are available daily, every day, 24 per 7. You don't have to finish, uh, uh, for example, first part of the course and then proceed to the second one. For example, you have 10 minutes and you want to learn new skills. Uh, first, you can choose you can choose uh, your cup of coffee, for example. An espresso is uh, an article which can be read by uh, in two, three minutes. A cappuccino, uh, an article which can be read in 10 minutes. Coffee and a croissant up to 30 minutes. So it means that uh, this is what help engage people and simplify using these course materials. We hope it will 
encourage people to use it as an everyday education tool. Our course is available in three languages, Ukrainian, English and Russian. It consists of five chapters. This course has uh, several short tests in every unit, but in general the course has a final test and if you pass this test, you can get a certificate. This test is actually not an easy one. Only a person uh, who have read all the materials can receive this certificate. We know that uh, the rate of getting these certificates is quite high, and we also know that a lot of our visitors uh, who read materials of the course, uh, we have teachers, we have professors, they use our articles to teach their students, school children and students uh, at universities. It really works. If you take a look at the next slide, slide number five, you can see uh, results of several researches, research. So these are the uh, uh, results of our learners. So what are the basic skills needed for critical thinking? Our course is completely open to anyone. It also contains an additional block which consists of blended education. It has uh, teaching materials which allow the uh, learners to learn online and also to attend offline courses, offline lessons. We developed these materials for blended education to be able to give people the opportunity to choose their style of education. If they want to study only online, they can do that. If they want to blend it with offline education, there is such an opportunity. Our facilitators our facilitators work as facilitators of blended education. And if you see, take a look at the next slide, you will see their smiling faces. <coughs> so this is uh, the first group of people who tried this blended education. Uh, the aim was to you to uh, go through this blended education course to uh, uh, read all the online materials then the, those people attended offline events with facilitators and using different exercises different tools uh, which allow to get information additional information in interactive way and to try them in practice, in real life, when communicating offline. So this is what our course is about. Uh, this is quite popular now, because people uh, love learning something new. So I hope that this blended education will provide us with more opportunities to study and learn something new. And I have two more slides I would like to show you visualization of the game which has been developed. This is Fake Busters game. This game has been developed for other participants as part of our project. It can be played individually or as part of a group. Participants uh, get packages of news, sets of news, so they need to use special skills on reading this information. Uh, people need to read a piece of news to find signs of disinformation, misinformation, manipulation. And there are different ways to work with these cases. So people use their skills and they get results. 
But it's not only about getting new information. It's a game. People get points. People compete against each other individually and as part of the group. And even our website is also interactive, so this game can be played online. On the next slide you will see all those happy people uh, who won as part of a game. So this, is, this was our first offline game. In the process of this quest, uh, people had a lot of discussions, so they analyzed news and they won. Uh, they won and they got a lot of new skills. This game is working now. We have a question from our audience. Uh, have you tried working with, for example, with MPs of the Verkhovna Rada, not only with students, children and teachers, or probably some political parties reached out to you for such education? Well, we haven't received any requests like that yet, and we haven't tried to reach out to them. Uh, but professors at universities, yes, so they reached out to us. Uh, they really like this uh, game and they use our articles, our materials, uh, and we also have uh, uh, librarians, we have teachers who also use our game. So, one more question from our uh, audience. Uh, what about you? How do you tell the truth from the fake, the truth from the misinformation? Do, can you remember such cases when you were victims to manipulation or disinformation? Maybe Nicholas can first take this question. Uh, as a behavior specialist, what can you tell about that? How do you differ differentiate between the fake news and the truthful news? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'll admit I have uh, fallen for, uh, for fake news in the past. Um, it's so easy to, to do. The problem is, is that, um, so the, a lot of the vulnerabilities uh, that are universal, that's uh, the phenomenon where we choose to believe what we want to believe. So we're more likely to believe information if it aligns with our previously held beliefs. The problem with that is that that affects us in so many different ways. It can affect us politically with partisanship. It can affect us uh, with uh, our own sort of uh, personal biases and prejudices. It can affect us with silly things. It's like, for example, um, if, uh, you know, if, if you hear something bad about a, a football team, I think it's like you're more likely to believe that it's true. So. It's very, very hard to completely avoid these problems. Um, the other one is that uh, the way that we receive information now is it's so intense. You know, um, when you talk about social media, people often re refer, re sorry, refer to the fire hose because there's so much information coming at you at once. Instagram, flipping through pictures. And the problem is, is that cognitively, our brains only have so much power to process information. And so what happens is that we won't actually evaluate critically each piece of information. We just sort of accept it, essentially, passively. And so it's very important to um, encourage people to engage more critically um, with the information, uh, to have a healthy level of, of skepticism. Um, to understand how we're being manipulated, so how the information environment can uh, be uh, manipulated to trick us, um, and to also be aware of our own personal vulnerabilities when it comes to our motivated reasoning our, and our own ideologies. Hmm. But yeah, no, I will admit, I've, I've, I've embarrassingly felt stuck. We um, very, very scared. We would set up um, groups on WhatsApp for our neighborhoods, uh, and it would help us coordinate uh, just citizens um, delivering food to elderly people, to people who were sick and couldn't go out. And there was a series of voicemails. 
that were, were voice notes that were sent around and were very, very common. And they were from a, a working class woman uh, describing how a puddle out was they had rented ambulances from being sent out because they were so overrun. This was the beginning of the health system essentially collapsing. For a moment, I was thinking, I was scared, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. And then for, I sat back and I realized, I any information about this. Where is this woman coming from? I haven't seen this anywhere else. It hasn't been verified. It's scary. Therefore, it's very emotive and more believable. It's quite conspiratorial. It, that could be another concerning thing. And I just thought hard and long for a moment and, and realized, actually, this what's going on here? I did some uh, some Googling afterwards. I immediately sort of uh, looked up on the internet to see if other people had seen this. And it turned out it was actually very common. And so there is an example of um, instinctively believing it because it, it's, sort of, it's very emotional. And then waiting a second, realizing I should think a bit more, a bit more carefully, doing some research, realizing it's fake, and then I push back, I, I put comments on the chat saying, this is fake, we should delete this, no one should believe it. Here's a, here's a link to the article. So it's not like all of us are vulnerable, but we can all do things to essentially build up our own resilience and then counter that false information. Super, it's a прекрасна відповідь, дуже щира. We all become victims to disinformation, but that, so not all of us can admit that. Lubov, the same question for you. How do you differentiate the truth from disinformation? Do you have any personal story when you have become the victim of disinformation? So I would like to say that I don't like the word the truth because we all have our own truth and that's why we try to avoid this word and to explain and to speak more and say that it's very important to identify those markers and those things that tell you about the existence of manipulation disinformation in the information whether it's a fact or it's a, some propaganda or manipulation. So I orient more on such markers and what my project taught me and what and that's what uh, my son was taught and I'm happy that he was growing growing up together with this project and together with me and when we uh, somewhere in the shopping mall see some channel and we have to watch TV the child says TV says one thing but it has to be checked you have to think if it is the information that they're telling us and it really it did it really happen but I shall be honest with you either have did I have cases in my life uh, when I believed something that turned out to be fakes yes of course because I'm a human being is and I'm, a human being is easy to manipulate especially if you appeal to emotions to something personal and of course it, it also happens to me is on some emotional background it's easy to manipulate anybody if it's something very personal to me so I'm trying to think like this hey Luba and what about media literacy you know about this think about it let's ask let's uh, go through a checklist is it emotionally colored yes okay now let's uh, think in a more detailed way so these are the things which are very important in my life and I uh, encourage the, you know, participants of IRIS project, uh, the teachers, and communicate this knowledge to my family, to my friends. And I think it's very important for people to obtain the skill to to identify the situation 
to self-identify identify situation and without labeling it as if it's the truth or something completely negative. It's important to acquire this skills. This is my opinion, so the way that I follow in my life. Thank you for your reply. One more question to both of you, to both experts. Tell me, please, uh, based on your experience, we have now lots of uh, forms and channels where disinformation is spread. We have WhatsApp messengers, we have Viber, there are deep fakes, there are video manipulations, there are proxy media. You are experts. So as experts, what other forms of manipulation do you think we can expect in the future? What can appear that we are not ready yet for? So let's start with Nicholas. Yeah, that's a good and, and terrifying question, to be honest. Um, I think uh, what we're going to see more of is uh, more of the same, first of all. So uh, we're going to see uh, the same tactics used um, sort of by uh, in, you know, um, complex information operations. We're going to see that democratized and we're going to see more individuals, political parties, private companies doing that. There's already been a, a series of incidents in uh, Central and South America where uh, PR uh, companies have been uh, other quite sophisticated methods to uh, manipulate the online environment. Um, we're seeing, a, 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 again, a proliferation of, of um, bot technology that's able to uh, manipulate reviews or products on Amazon, on online, uh, for restaurants, that kind of thing. And that's becoming cheaper and easier to use. Um, I think we're going to see a development of hybrid um, accounts. So those are ones that are half automated and half run by people, um, spreading more false information on closed platforms, such as WhatsApp, Fiverr, Kick, like you mentioned as well. That's very concerning, I think. Um, and then also, I think we could see a more aggressive use of things like deep fakes. Uh, we saw already lots of incidents. We uh, manipulated uh, to show, for example, a child being kidnapped. Uh, and these video clips resulted in the lynchings and the murder of people in um, Nigeria, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, and I believe in India. And so what happens when everyone can create a deep fake that shows one of their friends or a local political leader or a local religious leader saying something insulting? Recent studies, I believe by Stanford, have created a, a product that essentially allows you to not only uh, replace the face of someone, but also recreate their voice incredibly easily. And the thing is, is that people are worried because they think someone will make a video of President Trump declaring war on the pilot. But really, to identifying when those videos are fake. What I'm worried about is smaller level, at a local level, at a local political level. Uh, we saw what happened when uh, Russian activists or, or Russian militants uh, faked uh, incident happening in Ukraine. And if they had the technology to show a local Ukrainian politician saying something controversial, it would be even more devastating. Thank you. Lubov, what do you think? But what do you think? As for this thing, question, I think further on, the situation of complex packages of information is possible for disinformation. You know, when we speak about a case when disinformation gets uh, to us through some video channel, then in the future, it can be a complex information that they is planned in time. For example, first package information, visual, then 
goes to other channels so that people would have a connection between one piece of information with another piece of information which is going to make this process uh, the process of fighting or you know counter countering this uh, this disinformation much more difficult and the information will grow bigger the volume is going to be more and people will find it hard you know to follow the space of the, the the way this information is produced and maybe they will also take a more careful look before they spread this information or share this information they will think hey hold on a second i have to think whether this is uh, disinformation or not but i think in the future we shall have a problem with a big amount of information and it will be adding itself in order to um, you know target this disinformation that's what I think is possible ahead of us such complex things we will all have to accept and understand how to work with it in our lives how we are making our decisions could I also say um, one thing as well that I'd be uh, very wary of, and that is partic of particular importance for those working in the media, is the development of um, hackers, computer hackers, accessing um, newspapers, genuine, reliable newspapers, media outlets, and planting fake stories within them. You may see in a time once. Uh, in, uh, I think it was Qatar, uh, it started off the uh, Saudi Qatar. Uh, Maddox flat last year, um, and that's something that we should be worried about as well. Malign actors laundering their false information through genuine sources. And related to that, we also see an increase, at least of instances where this has been captured, is fake journalists being created. There was a famous example a man named Heshmat Alvi, supposedly a Iranian uh, human rights activist, but actually it appears he was a creation of political group MEK. He had submitted articles that had been published in very reputable newspapers. Submitting their work to genuine, reliable sources and then being published there. So, interesting times that we live in. Lots of challenges, lots of different new forms. And we see more and more of creative approaches to creating disinformation, more and more chan new channels appear. And our entire community working with uh, counteracting this phenomena, we have to be also creative and learn to think three steps ahead of them and to offer new s approaches and solutions. Will alternative uh, training or gamification can be one of those ideas we can give it a try but more and new and interesting things will be in the future so let's be creative and let's cooperate with our community to give a decent reply to such actions. So I would like to thank to all our audience, to all our speakers, and I would like to thank our interpreters for helping us to understand each other better and see you. And I would like to thank the DMF team as well. See you.